The problem that I'm trying to address is that human beings think of ourselves in terms of our utility value. And that's going to be the, mean the end of us. And partly because machines have more utility value than people. You know, we can always develop a machine that will have more utility value than, than a human being. This is kind of what Norbert Wiener was arguing back in the, in the guy who came up with cybernetics when he was thinking about feedback mechanisms and the first robots, that we're going to have to think about what's the human use of human beings. But to me, it, it bespeaks of a reversal of figure and ground, a reversal of subject and object. We're thinking about how does technology treat humans rather than how do human beings use technology. Right? So we are no longer the figures. We are no longer the actors. The intelligent agents have agency. So we've ended up living in a world where even those who want to make technology, in theory, that, that's nicer to people are still thinking about technology as something that plays us. And that's the experience I have and, and, and that I believe is, is, is real right now, is that I'm not using my technology. My technology uses me. Every time I swipe my smartphone, it gets smarter about me and I get dumber about it. But the, the, the response that I'm trying to, to provoke is not another techno-solutionist response. I don't think it's about, let's write algorithms to beat the algorithms that are hurting us. You know, let's, you know, a new army of that, or let's develop a better social media network that does this, or a better smartphone algorithm. No, I think what, what I'm trying to do is a little bit more homeopathic in spirit, or naturopathic, rather than fighting the disease and even giving more weight and authority to that digital, oh, the digital monster, let's get offline, no. Let's enhance our human resilience. Right? Let's in, in, enhance our own, our own vitality, our cultural immune response. You know, if there's weaponized memes out there, then I don't want my kid using a weaponized meme filter. I want my kid being strong enough to not respond to the weaponized meme. When, when in the States we had this uh, Twitter phenomenon where there was this video of some MAGA kid, a kid with a MAGA hat, facing off with a Native American. And it was like 20 seconds it started out, like this 20 second video. And I saw all my friends, smart friends, professors of media friends, and tweeting that, retweeting, my God, look at this horrible fascist child. And, what. and I, was, I was kind of amazed. It's like, wait a minute, can't you be a human being for a minute? Can't you be smart enough to realize you're not there? You don't know what happened. You're, re you're reacting to a picture on social media and using it to vent whatever the rage you have against the Trump presidency or against MAGA people or against racism. Or, and of course, you know, as they pull back, it became another story and they pull back a little bit more and it became yet another story. So the object of the game is not to teach Twitter how to make sure that these bad messages don't come through. That's like saying, well, let's just rid the world of viruses. No, the, the, the object of the game is to increase our own immune response as people, our collective cultural immune response. And the way to do that is to have enough solidarity between people who can sit in rooms together, make eye contact, have conversations, and not feel so threatened they can't tolerate one another. You know, every semester that I teach, I've only taught for five years now, every semester I get more notes from students on the first day of class, notes signed by their psychiatrists saying, please excuse Johnny from class participation and presentations. But because Johnny's got, you know, it's a, a anxiety, social anxiety. And I'm sure that's real, but why is there so much? Why hasn't Johnny been trained in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, how to be in a room with other people? You know, it's because Johnny's education has been surrendered to Johnny's utility value. Let's make him a good worker. You know, anyone in, in the UK who knows the history of public education here, you, you know public education was not to make better workers. Public education was started to give dignity to the coal worker so that they'd be working in the mines all day, but at least they could come home and have the dignity of being able to read a novel or participate intelligently in, in representative democracy. When we turn education into, extensions, into an extension of work, all we've really done is taken a corporate cost and externalized it to the public sector. And we've devalued education. So it's no longer teaching people that they have essential dignity when they come in that room.
but they're going to have to learn something in order to be useful, valuable members of society. And the principals of the schools meet with the CEOs of the companies to find out, oh, what do you want them to know? Do you want them to know Excel? You want them to know Java? You want them to know Python? We'll deliver you the employee of the future. You know, and if you're an employee, there are no jobs in the future, but that's <laughs> another story. Right? Employment, but it's fine. Employment is temporary. We can talk about that. Employment was invented in the, in the Renaissance. It's not, it's not essential to work. It's just, it's really, employment was a way to prevent people from owning their own businesses. They had to go work for chartered monopolies. That's when employment was born. Uh, but that's, that's a whole other story. So yeah, so I'm arguing that once we can learn to establish and maintain basic rapport with one another, that's when the great human conspiracy can begin. And I mean it, the word conspiracy literally. Conspire means what? To breathe together. Right? People breathing together right now, that constitutes a conspiracy. If you can breathe together with other people in a room. Because then the whole thing, the whole artifice uh, uh, begins to unravel. You know, and you start to experience your, your power. And you start to experience the dignity of yourself and the dignity of the other people uh, that you're with. And once you touch that core of dignity in yourself and others, then uh, it's much, much harder uh, to be controlled by, by anyone or anything.